Hello, Booktube. I was out and about when I got the news about this latest attack in London. Uh, and even before I could get the details of it, one of my first reactions was to think about the UK booktubers, who are such a huge part of what I watch every week. And I guess that's a, an indication of how far booktube has made its way into my, you know, everyday walking around mine, that in, in a city of nine million people, I wondered right away if these, these dozen people that I watch were okay. Um, and then I get back and I've been, I've been looking at the news and I will watch the story for the rest of the day. Uh, but I thought, you know, as, as callow as it might seem, maybe we could all use a nice mail hall <laughs> uh, to, to uh, I don't know, distract us for a moment from the world we live in. Uh, I floated briefly yesterday the idea that maybe I was doing too many book hauls on this channel and heard in no uncertain terms from the rest of you that that is not the case. <laughs> Dozens of comments, and well, I'm up to now 72 emails uh, telling me, no, mail halls are just fine. <laughs> it's, 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 I don't need my arm twisted. It's perfectly fine by me. I love it because it gives me a chance to, to open the mail with you all, which is tons of fun. And a couple of people mentioned another thing that I'm hoping that it serves for you, which is to give you a rough idea of what's coming out, which, you know, in the short term and the long term can be useful to people who spend too much time in bookstores. <laughs> uh, so I thought we'd just go through uh, this pile. There are no boxes, but it's a fairly good size haul. Uh, we'll start with this little one here. Uh, if those of you who are actually in the UK, especially those of you who are in London, uh, feel free in the comments field or an email to let me know how you're doing. Uh, but in the meantime, let's uh, let's just... Oh, great. Okay. I, uh, I requested this. This comes out uh, in, in late August. It's called Shooting Ghosts. A U.S. Marine, a combat photographer, and their journey back from war. Let me read you a bit of the description. It intrigued me. Uh, war tears people apart, but it can also bring them together in unpredictable ways. T.J. Brennan, a decorated Marine sergeant, and Finbar O'Reilly, a world-trotting war photographer, became friends as they patrolled the Hemland province. Their bond deepened after Brennan was injured during a Taliban ambush and both returned home. Brennan began to suffer the effects of his injuries and from the fallout of his tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. War correspondents usually experience post-traumatic stress similar to that of combat veterans. Brennan is haunted by the things he'd done and didn't do. O'Reilly wrestles with photographing people at their most vulnerable and being unable to help while his colleagues die on the job. Their friendship offered them both a shot at redemption. Uh, and the, 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 it looks like a study in chemistry that, that you know, the, the, uh, the Marines are, are sort of off the cuff think of the photojournalists who follow them around as a little bit contemptible, a, a little bit uh, ridiculous. <laughs> like they have to earn it. Like they're more gadflies. Like, like they're more uh, bystanders than anything else. Uh, when I think this book is makes clear what a couple of books in the last 10 years have made clear, which is that it, they're they're in a combat situation too. Uh, and they pay a lot of the same psychological prices. I, 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 can't, I can't wait to read it. Uh, and yet I don't know that I will make it a priority for this week. I think I, I, think I will uh, wait until a little bit closer to the summer. Uh, let's see here. Okay, great. Uh, this also comes out in August. Uh, this is a, a Bond Galley. This is The Man from the Train. And it's by Bill James, and the subtitle is The Sol Solving of a Century Old Serial Killer Mystery. Uh, I wonder if I have a. This is a very, very preliminary edition here. Uh, yeah, the legendary baseball writer and true crime expert Bill James teams up with his daughter to solve a century old mystery surrounding a series of horrifying axe murders in small towns across America. Around the turn of the 20th century, families across the country were being bludgeoned to death in their sleep with the blunt side of an axe. At the time, few people believed the crimes were related, but in The Man from the Train, the authors compellingly argue that the murders were committed by a single criminal who used the rail system to elude detection. I, uh, of course, was fascinated by that, so, so uh, a little closer to the time. Again, this will be another thing. I don't think I'll read it right away. I think I'll wait until the summertime. Uh, it is very much not summer here in Boston today. It's mind-bogglingly cold, uh, 
with more mind-boggling cold and snow in the long-range forecasts. <laughs> so, uh, oh, okay, here's another August book. Good Lord, my August shelf is going to be huge. Uh, this is One Summer Day in Rome by Mark Lamprell. Uh, it's, it's a novel. Fans of love, actually. Here comes a novel about three couples drawn irresistibly to Rome, narrated by the city itself. Brimming with wit and charm and gelato, <laughs> One Summer Day in Rome is the most delicious book you will read this summer. Uh, <laughs> so it's narrated by Rome. I didn't know that. Let's let's see what that sounds like. Uh, Uh, let me tell you about Rome, my beloved Roma. So ancient she is called Eternal, the city that has always been and will always be. Assured of her own magnificence, her venerable significance, she does not seek comparison, and yet I find it almost impossible not to compare her. So that's not narrated by Rome. That's narrated about Rome. Uh, no, this is not narrated by the city of Rome. Uh, Unless, it's, unless it happens later in the book, but we shall see. Again, I uh, I will wait. Uh, let's see. Let's move on. Hmm. One summer day in Rome. I spent summer days in Rome. And they really liked it. Ah, okay. All right. This is uh, James Wright, Enduring Vietnam. Uh, this is An American Generation and Its War. Uh, the Vietnam War is largely recalled as a mistake either in the decision to engage there or in the nature of the engagement or both. Veterans of the war remain largely anonymous figures, accomplices in the mistake. Critically recounting the steps that led to the war, this book does not excuse the mistakes, which brings those who served out of the shadows. Enduring Vietnam recounts the experiences of young Americans who fought in Vietnam and of families who grieved those who did not return. By 1969, nearly half of the junior enlisted men who died in Vietnam were draftees, uh, and their median age was 21. Among the non-draftees, it was only 20. Wow, okay. So, so this, I think, comes out very soon. This will not be an August book. Yeah, this comes out in early April. Uh, all of these things, I, I know that it's not strict, but all of these things have the, have the, the release date of April 4th, the first Tuesday of April, so I, I don't know. <laughs> That's going to be quite a log jam for me. Uh, on that day, I won't do them all on the same day, but uh, but I'm I uh, I fell a little bit behind with the reviews that I do for Open Letters Weekly, the the little Steve section of Open Letters Monthly. I fell a little bit behind on that. So far in 2017, uh, the the ramped up workload that I'm doing for the Christian Science Monitor has sort of uh, thrown the the, the well-oiled machinery of Open Letters Weekly off the rails, and I. I, uh, I mean to fix that uh, in the spring, in April. So uh, these things that these books that I'm getting just one after another after another with the release date of the fourth of April, I intend to get to them all. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, let's let's move on. We've got a couple of small ones here, uh, which is okay. Steve doesn't need chunkers; he prefers them, but he doesn't need them. Uh, uh, okay, this is from Harvard University Press. It's a little thing called Kin, How We Came to Know Our Microbe Relatives. <laughs> uh, this is this is due uh, in April as well. Since Darwin, people have speculated about the evolutionary relationships among dissimilar species, including our connections to the diverse form of life known as microbes. In the 1970s, biologists discovered a way to establish these kinships. This new era of exploration began with Linus Pauling's finding that every protein in every cell contains a huge reservoir of evolutionary history. His discovery opened a research path that has changed the way biologists and others think about the living world, but not all others. <laughs> Steve is, is, compelled, <laughs> is compelled to point out, not all others have changed their mind about how the living world works based on the fact of, the, of evolutionary biology the whole discipline of evolutionary biology and the group that most especially has not changed its opinion is creationists creationist christians uh, i'm leaving aside here creationist uh, muslims uh, creationist christians with whom i have quite a bit to do um, 
simply do not acknowledge it. They, they don't even seem to want to make an effort to understand what it means. <laughs> Evolutionary biology. To make, it, to, by, to make an effort to understand what it means to study evolution in the cellular record. They, they just they go on endlessly, mechanically, compulsively about fossils and rock strata and what or what Charles Darwin did or did not know in the 1870s. They go on about it compulsively. I read just this week, I read two forthcoming books on creationism, on young earth creationism, when many, many prominent scientists have pointed out that we could have no fossil record at all. If, if all we had to go on was cellular evolutionary record, that would seal the deal right there. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Uh, it it would be it would be really nice if Book Two had a resident scientist, maybe one who reads, who'd be willing to review books like this for open letters. That would be really nice. <laughs> anyway, anywho, let's move on. That's it. That's it. The uh, the common refrain that I have, the, the mental refrain that I have, is that I still think somehow, despite uh, quite a few failed efforts, I still think somehow that I'm not utilizing, I'm not tapping into a reservoir of critical talent that might be out there in, in, in book two world. I, I don't know if it's just the way I'm trying to look for it or the way it needs to adapt to me. I don't, I don't know one way or another, but uh, I know that quite a few of you have uh, areas of expertise that branch off from my own. <laughs> uh, and, and I know for sure from watching your channels that all of you at least know the basics of how to think critically about a book and therefore maybe how to write critically about a book. I just, I'll figure it out. <laughs> I'll figure it out. It's been a year. I'll figure it out. Uh, 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 the next one here, though, is uh, a debut novel. It's One of the Boys by Daniel Margar Magariel. There he is. He's originally from Kansas City. Uh, he got a BA from Columbia University and an MFA from Syracuse University. That's what he looks like. His, biogra his biography here says that he lives in New York. I think it's safe to say he lives in Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, and the pub sheet has, takes a very weird stance. I just saw this. It's 165 dazzling pages by a new talent. <laughs> I'm not sure that you would want to list exactly how many pages. <laughs> what if they're not good? <laughs> what if that's a sentence, a threat, rather than a promise? <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, what what is this uh, what is this about? Uh, Scribner is so excited to announce Mar the March fourteenth publication date of one of the boys uh, uh, last week. Uh, Daniel Magariel Magariel's masterful debut novel tells the emotionally harrowing story of two young brothers and their psychologically and physically abusive father. When a twelve year old boy and his brother and his older brothers side with their father through a bitter divorce and custody war, they are united by the exciting possibility of carving out a new life together. What started as a grand adventure soon deteriorates into a desperate game of survival. The boys watch their father become an erratic and violent embodiment of the man they loved and trusted. With stunning prose and chilling clarity, one of the boys conveys a young boy's desperate struggle to hold on to a dangerous piece of his shattered family. Oh. Okay, with the emotional core of Hanya Yanagihara's Little Life and the compact power of Justin Torres' We the Animals, Magariel has created the most moving, remarkable 165-page novel you'll ever read. How many 165-page novels have you read? Do you keep count? <laughs> what is that even? I don't even know what that is. It's just, uh, I've never seen that before. Is that aimed at the Goodreads crowd? That, that compulsively... Uh, status stat sheets everything I, I don't know uh so it has a this thing has a cover blur by george saunders which is no small thing uh and it let's see it starts off my father was swerving around cars speeding honking that's the first sentence that's very bad his father's not honking <laughs> his father's not speeding <laughs> Speeding wouldn't be too bad because the only way you get around a car at high speed is with a car, so you can sort of assume that. But honking is something that animals do and people can as well, so it ruins the sentence. Speeding maybe would work for you to assume a car. Honking is funny. It's inadvertently funny. 
it's the, presents the, the the very first sentence presents the mental image of his father honking, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> which is not what the author wants to do. I rested my head on the strap of the seat belt, tried to ignore how fast he was driving, unsure if he was outgunning the storm or just angry with me. That's the second sentence. Do you, are you physically capable of resting your head on the strap of a seatbelt? My mother and I had gotten into a fight. She'd called him to come pick me up from her apartment. He resented any dealings with her. It was midday, spring. A shadow crept across the fields. Crows looked on from power lines. The warning sirens wailed. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I, I mean, you. Should, I. I'm not wrong to pre, to 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 put a certain amount of stress on the first part, the very first part of any of any novel, because it's been seen the most. It's been worked over the most. As an opening paragraph, that has no promise whatsoever. And yet, this thing has a list of blurbs as long as your arm. So, I've got to assume. I will assume uh, that the that it gets better <laughs> as it goes along. Uh, I, I will definitely assume that. Uh, so I will give this thing. It's late. I'm late coming to it, so I will probably read it tonight. Uh, and then we've got this thing, satisfyingly heavy. Could be a finished copy. No uh, Steve books yet. Uh, so it'd be nice if this was one of them. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. It's a great big biography, but it's not exactly a Steve book. <laughs> I'm kidding. Couldn't really be. It's uh, John Farrell's new biography of Richard Nixon. This is the finished copy. Uh, uh, I'm very glad the publisher got this to me so quickly. I asked for the finished copy because I have uh, this thing. I have the, the advanced copy, which I like. I'm reviewing it for the Christian Science Monitor. I'm writing a review today. Uh, and I very much prefer to work from a finished copy, especially with a scholarly work, you know, that you, where you want to make sure you're dealing with the book that the customer is going to see. Uh, so this is great to have this. And uh, <laughs> And I won't, I will, if I remember correctly, if I remember, I will try to leave a link to my review somewhere once it runs. Uh, but I can't recommend this book highly enough. <laughs> I really can't. Not just in terms of the comprehensiveness of the way that it studies Richard Nixon, although that is the critical apparatus. Look at the size of that. It's nearly 200 pages of critical apparatus. But it's not just that. It's also how wonderfully it's written. Oh my God! I uh, I can't recommend this highly enough. I will uh, I will try to remember to, I, when my review runs. I will try to remember to leave a link. Actually, that's a question uh, that I that I had uh, for the rest of you. Uh, whether or not it might be something that I should do. I've had a couple of people suggest that maybe I should do. A couple of people who aren't connected with BookTube suggest that maybe I should make a website of my own, stevedonahue.com, something like that. Something very basic that brings together everything I do, links to everything I do, so that, uh, so that you, you can go there and see blog posts, Open Letters Weekly, Open Letters Monthly, The National in Abu Dhabi, The Washington Post, The, uh, the American Conservative, uh, and The Christian Science Monitor. Well, you, can, you can see everything that I'm doing and maybe even arrange it so that you can also see on the side uh, you know, my Twitter feed or something like that uh, or maybe a, a list of, of books acquired or, or a title and author of books acquired stuff like that just a, a general clearinghouse a couple of people I know for years actually one of them for years has been saying you know, look you're you you do as much work or more than all the rest of us us being book critics but you're all over the world where the rest of us aren't <laughs> so so you know I, I'm forever wondering if I've caught everything you've written and I can't be the only one who wants to know what you're doing, what you're working on. You should make a website. Uh, and I, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that. But the more I think about it, the more I think it might be a good idea. Of course, I don't have the faintest idea how to do it. I will go to Chris Rhodes, and I will, I will whine and cry like a little baby. <laughs> uh, but let me know if, if, if you feel like it. Let me know if that is of interest uh, to you. I, I. I've had, I have friends and people who aren't in the book reviewing world who say, you know, it would be great to have one place where I could go and see what you're doing. Um, and, you know, maybe even a field, a, a feed could be in there for uh, links to these videos. Uh, so it's all in one place. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the possibilities are. I haven't really examined it. 
Uh, but anyway, we're at, we're at the last one here. Uh, I guess I guess Richard Nixon does count as a Steve book. I, I I don't I'm no fan of the man, but it's certainly one of the best biographies that I've read this year. I, I don't think it will be displaced, although. Uh, we've, hit, we've been in biography doldrums since the 1st of January, but that is going to change. 2017 looks like it's going to be a fantastic year for biographies. Just fantastic. We shall see. It's my favorite uh, genre, so I always I always hope. Uh, for instance, uh, er, earlier in the year, I got uh, John Stubbs' new biography of Jonathan Swift. I didn't review it anywhere, but it was spectacularly good. And much as I hate to say it again, because like Richard Nixon, he's not my guy, but I, I think on this channel we've seen not one but two advanced copies of new biographies of Martin Luther, and they were both great. <laughs> one significantly better than the other, but still both wonderful. So <laughs> it's looking good. Uh, anyway, let's see what this last one is. Uh, oh, great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, this comes out in May. It's by Jeff Shara, who's the son of Michael Shara, the author of The Killer Angels, a book I cannot recommend highly enough about the Civil War. If you do, if you have not read The Killer Angels, hie thee to a library immediately and rectify that situation. But this is Jeff Shara, his son, uh, who I always think of as an 18-year-old, but he's probably 80. And he's he has written a whole career of historical novels in his father's footsteps. Uh, and his latest one, the one that comes out in May, is called The Frozen Hours. And it's a novel, a nice, long novel about the Korean War which is sparsely represented in historical fiction uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading it and, and uh, I think what I'm going to do is uh, construct at the Christian Science Modern in addition to my weekly reviews I also once a month do a three book roundup on some theme did, did uh, Black History Month, did Women's History Month uh, and I think what I'd like to do is construct a three-book roundup around historical fiction and pick the three best historical fictions coming out in May. Uh, uh, well, this I, I very much want to write about this somehow, somewhere, so, so we'll see. Uh, and then the last two things I want to show you didn't come in the mail, but I, I did get them today, and I, I wanted to include them since this is a hideously long video anyway. And the first one I got at the comic shop, because it's Wednesday, which is New Comic Book Day, and it's this, Batman by Brian K. Vaughn. Uh, who's the the author? And this is this this volume collects uh, uh, Batman issues that Brian K. Vaughan wrote in the very turn of the twenty first century, two thousand two thousand one, something like that. I think they're they're a good two decades old. Uh, with w most of them, with art by the great Scott McDaniel, who is the best Batman artist in recent memory, the best Batman artist in my opinion ever. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of these individual issues, but I was very happy to see a collection because the individual issues are buried in white boxes somewhere, and are you know they fray, they fall apart. Whereas uh, the Brian K. Vaughan's Batman is not to be missed. It's a wonderful interpretation of the character, so I was very happy to see this. And also at the Brattle, I only got one book at the Brattle, but what a book! The Book of Jonah, by the great Peter Spears, whose work I have praised on this channel before. Uh, uh, for its detail, it's just incredible detail. Look at the when when Jonah goes to uh, Joppa to take ship away from the will of the Lord. Look at the detail in there; it's just incredible. Uh, and I didn't, I confess, I didn't know that Peter Spears even did a book on the Book of Jonah. It was just it was just sitting there on the top of the brattle table inside, and I was overjoyed to find it. Uh, so. There you have it. So there's uh, an oldie bit of goodie, Peter Spears' uh, uh, book on the Book of Jonah, then Brian K. Vaughn's stint on Batman, Jeff Shar writing about the Frozen Hours, a book about the Korean War, John Farrell, a great biographer, his new book on uh, Richard Nixon, uh, One of the Boys by uh, Daniel Mag Magariel, a uh, debut uh, novel, uh, Kin, about what we share with microbes, <laughs> uh, Enduring Vietnam, by James Wright, uh, which looks like it's going to have a strong narrative component from a uh, soldier's perspective, which would be harrowing to read, but uh, but very worthwhile. Uh, one day, one summer day in Rome, a novel, The Man from the Train, uh, a, a new true crime thriller, uh, and Shooting Ghosts, about uh, a Marine who forms a friendship with a war photographer. Uh, and there you go. 
<laughs> so here's a, a book haul, maybe to form a little distraction. I'm, uh, I'm going to go now and actually check in with a lot of UK people that I know and, and see how they're doing. Uh, because, you know, these things, these attacks, they're inevitable in the new world that we live in. It makes it all the more important when they happen, no matter where they happen. We're all going to bear these scars uh, to grab on to each other it makes it all the more important to do that not to assume that everything's fine uh so, <laughs> so i will do that no to end on a somber note uh i will do that and i will be back <laughs> thank you booktube